Good morning. Welcome to Cross Community Church. My name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here and the director of our Regen ministry. And if you haven't heard, uh, Regen is having a relaunch this Tuesday starting at 6. And uh, Regen is just a, it's a 12-step, Christ-centered, uh, discipleship-based recovery program. And we're just really excited, looking forward to the launch of it. And this morning, we have Chuck Adair joining us. He is a, a staff member at Watermark Community Church in Dallas, and he works with the region ministry down there. And he's, he serves as a coach for all the churches that have uh, region implemented there. And he's just been a really, uh, a really great friend. He's, he's given us a lot of great advice, and we're just really excited to have him here this morning. Why don't you guys welcome Chuck? Thanks, Brandon. Hey, good morning, friends. If I were starting a region ministry, I would start it this way by saying, my name is Chuck. I have a new life in Christ. I struggle with or in recovery for lust, codependency, control, and this week, just a tad of anxiety in the sense that I'm in a room full of brand new folks, right? And so as an introvert that is meeting a lot of new people all the time, my, I will tell my wife after we've had, and, and I've been in church literally in these kind of roles pretty much most of my life, and I still have to go home, lie down, be real still, and get over all of you occasionally just because I'm an introvert, right? Yeah, I, people are, are difficult at times, and yet these opportunities to come and share and talk about, as Brandon said, regeneration, which is recovery in Christ when life is broken. I think recovery is a word that sort of gets misused a lot because everybody thinks of recovery as drug and alcohol and maybe sex addiction and a few pornography addiction, those kind of things. We don't talk about recovery being, man, we all struggle with sin, Sin is an issue that creates issues for us consistently. And because sin is in our life, in our brokenness, instead of letting Jesus be Lord, we allow things in our life to become the idols that we bow down to. And so this morning, I want to really kind of talk through that by using a very specific example in Scripture out of Daniel chapter 3. So if you've got your Bible, I'd invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 3, and I'd like to introduce this idea this way. In August of 2000, there was a Russian submarine called the Kursk. It had an explosion on that submarine, and it sank to the bottom. In that, 118 men perished, 23 survived for a period of time. You can see what that submarine looks like recovered and the damage that explosion did. One of those 27 or one of those 23 men was a young lieutenant by the name of Dmitry Kolokoskov. Dmitry Kolokoskov was kind of in charge of an area that was somewhat protected when that explosion happened, and he found himself in the midst of these other men. But here's what he knew, as well as everyone in that room with him. He was going to die. There was no way that they were going to get to them in time. There was no way that they were going to be able to survive this moment. He was going to die. In those moments where your mortality comes into great questions, what do you say? What do you write? How do you act? And he wrote his wife this note, and in the note that, that is fr was framed by his coffin when they buried him are these words, mustn't despair. Not really clear if they were directed at himself, if they were directed toward his wife, if they were looking at what was to come in the next life, but he kept saying over and over, mustn't despair. Choosing what matters most in life is something we find in Daniel chapter 3. Three young men, probably about the same age as, Dim as Dmitry Kolokoskov, are having to make a decision knowing that they are going to force or going to face their own mortality. What do we do? The king says we have to bow down to this golden statue that he has erected. And if we refuse, death is imminent. How do you respond 
when the harsh realities of life come calling? What do you do in those moments where it is difficult and hard and you're not sure the next steps that you're going to take? But you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had a choice in this matter. Death was escapable. Bow your knee and you, the whole nightmare ends. You will live. All the king wanted was for them to say a word of worship, bow their knee to his God, and they could go on with life. But they refused. They refused to bow the knee. They refused to, to deal with that moment in the way the king wanted them to. And so here it is life or death. And they chose death. I want you to think about that for a second. And I want you to see what they said to the most powerful man on the earth at the moment. Daniel 3, verses 17 through 18. If we are thrown into the burning flames, the God who we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Mustn't despair. Look what he says in verses 19 through 20. The Nebuchadnezzar, furious <coughs> with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it says his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers to tie, in, in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them on this blazing furnace. The Hebrew of that literally means this, the expression on his face changed. Have you ever made somebody so mad that you literally can see the expression on, their, on your face change. Or somebody can see that. Parents, it's all right. You can confess that at this moment because your kids have done that occasionally, right? You just have been so irritated at what they have done. Your expression changes and everybody knows it. And he orders the furnace heated up seven times hotter. Seven is an interesting term, particularly in the Old Testament. When it says something seven times, it means to the nth degree. Literally, this furnace has been heated to the nth degree. It is as hot as they know how to make it because they want to, he wants to see these three men literally obliterated. And he wants to see it in a moment. I have some experience with fire. Not good experience with fire. At eight years old, I was living with my grandparents who lived on a farm about 20 miles from Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville is my hometown. I said in the, in the first assembly, the reason I sound like I do is I grew up in Nashville. So a Tennessee boy. I've lived since 1984 in North Texas, so you've got, a, you've got a conversion of two different accents, Texan and Tennessean, that comes together. My wife says, some words, honey, you say sound a lot like mush, and she's right, and I understand that, but I loved my upbringing, and I loved the fact that, man, we could do a lot of things on that farm every, I, I'm eight, and every Friday night, I would have friends that would come and spend the night. Now, I'm also 61. So that's going to let you know that I actually grew up in a time when television signed off the air, long before the days of cable, long before the days of televangelist, and long before the days of infomercials that run from 12 o'clock in the morning to about 6 o'clock in the morning, right? Long before all of those days, literally the days when the test pattern showed up, right? That we didn't even have, listen, I'm so old, DVDs hadn't been invented. Some of you are looking at me going, what's that anyway? VHS tapes had not been invented. The rest of you are going, oh my word, he is that old. Actually that old. I mean, I remember all of that. You had TV, that was it. We'd stayed up, we'd watched it, the test pattern had come on, TV was signing off, my buddy looks at me and goes, man, I'm hungry. And I said, me too. I said, why don't we roast some bologna? 
And he went, oh, that's a great idea. Well, we had a fireplace, but it wasn't lit. My grandparents had gone to bed long before we had. And so we went out, got wood, put it on the fireplace. And I went and got what I thought I'd seen my grandfather get as lighter fluid for that fire. But it wasn't lighter fluid. It was kerosene. And I doused that fire with kerosene, doused it, because I believe if a little bit's good, a lot's better. And so I made sure it was good and soaked. And then my buddy's there watching, and I take that match, and I strike it. And you know you have those slow moment moments in life where everything slows down, and you can see it. I remember striking the match. I remember throwing it into the flame. And I remember that match hitting that flame, and I have never seen fire like that. And it came roaring out, and I remember diving to one side, but my buddy, not as quick and really kind of intent on seeing what the fire looks like, just takes that full frontal. It took every eyebrow off his, uh, off his face. It took his hair and it made him look like he was that 40-year-old guy that needed Rogaine desperately. It, 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 about half of his hair was taken off in that moment. It made him look like, because he had this orange sort of glow to him after that. I mean, he looked more like an orangutan than a human being in that moment. And with that boom that happened, my grandparents kept running out. Somebody in the first service asked this question. They said, what happened to you as a result from that? Let's just say they had an attitude adjustment with me on my rear end that I have not forgotten in low these many years that have gone that went on. But in that moment, they were just thrilled that I hadn't blown the house up and that my buddy wasn't killed. And the only question that he could ask in that moment, you think my dad will find out? Dude, <laughs> I think your dad's going to figure it out pretty quick that something hasn't gone really, really well for you in this moment. Listen, that's exactly the kind of fire that we're talking about this morning in Daniel 3. The kind of fire that just comes out of nowhere, consumes everything, makes it difficult in every way to deal with any of those things. The kind of fire that is hard to deal with and work our way through. And that is where these guys are in all of those things. They could have escaped it, though. By just bowing their knee to the idols in their life, they could have escaped it. Look at verses 21 through 23. So these men wearing their trou robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. So researchers have documented what is called the backdraft effect. It looks like this. It is where the fire is so intense, it sucks all of the gases in and then explodes the gases outward. And it literally obliterates everything in its path. Firefighters that experience the backdraft effect a lot of times do not survive because the explosion is so difficult. That is what is going on in Daniel chapter 3. You see that moment take place, and these guys, fully bound, fully clothed, are thrown into the fire. Now, I want you to think about what that must have been like for them. They're waiting for this moment. They know, just as Demetrius Kolokoskov understood, you're not, I'm not coming out of this alive unless God intervenes. Unless there is a miraculous moment, I am not going to be able to survive this. They are thrown into that fire, expecting their lungs to be seared, their bodies to be obliterated, and life to be over just like that. And yet, this amazing story changes all of that moment. They're in the fire. They wait for the searing pain, the horrific agony, all of the things that are there. But all at once, they realize, 
hey, we're not tied up anymore. Ooh, we're able to walk around. What in the world? We are supposed to be dead. And yet we're not only not dead, we're able to survive this without any kind of difficulty. The best part is this is more than a miracle. This becomes a divine encounter. Look at verses 24 through 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. And he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? And they replied, certainly, O king. And he said, but look. I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar faces a word that we are familiar with. It is the word trepidation. He sees this moment, and he literally is scared to death because he does the count. Didn't we put three men in the fire? Yes, O king, we did. But there's a fourth man walking around this fire, and he looks like a son of the gods. Here's my question. Could it be the son of God? One who would not let this moment go by one who decided to meet his three that decided they would not bow their knee to the idols that were set up. And he met them in the midst of this fire that is there. I wonder if that fourth man told the three how proud the father was of their loyalty and their devotion. I wonder if he told them that because of their great act of devotion, those gross, grotesque Babylonian names would never be forgotten. I wonder if he told them that people who had hard decisions to make about what mattered would find courage and strength because of their, their story as they face suffering. I wonder what it looked like for people who experience persecution, for standing firm with things that aren't popular or easy. And I wonder what they said to the fourth man. How do you deal with coming face to face with the Son of God. I wonder if they expressed their thanksgiving for all of the strength that he had given them in that moment. I wonder if they expressed their awe and adoration for what they're experiencing right now. The thing they thought would be the worst moment of their life turned out to be the best thing they had ever experienced. I wonder if they just weren't overcome by the presence of the one who would not let them go through the fire alone. I wonder. See, I think this is true. There are times that God delivers us from the fire. He doesn't let us go through it. He did it with Peter. He did it with Paul. You see it over and over where God does not allow the fire to consume. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. And you don't have to face these hard things, these consequences, these difficulties that show up. But here is the thing that I find interesting about that story. Yes, it is true that God, sometimes God meets us or delivers us from the fire. But so often in our life, God meets us in the fire, right in the middle of the worst moments of our life. And some of those moments are by our own choosing. Because unlike Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we have bowed knees to idols. We have allowed those idols to have control over our life. We have been those ones who have not kept our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. All of those things are there. I think it's a great description of regen, that God meets you in the fires of your life. In a moment where you feel the most despair, he reminds you, mustn't despair. 
See, I think that Jesus says to people still, I'll meet you in the fire. I know it's scary. I know it's dark. I know you never thought you would ever be in this circumstance or situation. But I will meet you in the fire. See, what I have found in Scripture, I've also found to be true in life. I would divide my life into three acts. Act one was really kind of its own moment. My dad was the number one country music uh, DJ on the number one country music station in Nashville, uh, Tennessee, for 27 years. My mom died of pancreatic cancer when I was six. My dad, from the time I was six until I was 17, was married and divorced some seven times. He loved being in love. He divorced my mom when I was two. My first childhood memory is him walking out of our house with a tie rack. And to this day, I can tell you every color and every design on that tie rack. Don't ever think that your kids don't pay attention to things that happen. They do. That moment shaped my life. I was raised by grandparents who loved me and took care of me and encouraged me. But here was the thing. In, in the course of my growing up years, lust had always been a difficulty for me. It led to pornography, and pornography became a secret sin that I kept while I was in junior high, high school, into college, going to seminary, and in my first 17 years of a ministry career. And I thought to myself, man, that part of my life I keep over here. My church life I keep over here. My family life I keep over here. I had everything wonderfully compartmentalized, and I didn't think any of those things would blend. That's what we call managing sin, that I can, I can keep this in the dark recesses of my life and it not affect me, it not change me, it not disturb my heart. And yet there is, I would tell people, I, know a, I knew a lot about Jesus, a lot. Man, I, I, I was quick on the verses. I, can, I could fire out a Bible verse, you know, for every situation, every problem. I was on top of that. But there's a difference in knowing and knowing. A real difference, it's there. And what I thought would never translate into the real part of my life where other people were involved did. In the 1990s, I got involved with a student. And as a result of that affair, ended up on America's Most Wanted, ended up on the Oprah Winfrey show, not because of anything good I had done, but because of sin that brought reproach upon the church and ended up with a 10-year conviction that sent me to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for nine and a half of those 10 years. There is a $20,000 fine that I still pay off every month as a result of that offense that occurred in the 1990s. I could easily say, my name is Chuck. I have a new life in Christ. I struggle with lust, codependency, control, and I'm a recovering Pharisee. See, it is one thing to know the gospel. It's another thing to know Jesus, to really know Jesus the one who transforms not just the outward parts of your life, but one that transforms everything. Listen, friends, if I, could keep, if I could help you know anything this morning, it is this. Jesus did not come to make you better. Jesus came to make you new, that you have a new life in Christ. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. That we are new creatures, new creations. We are not better people because Jesus has come. He takes a heart that is broken and he rebuilds it and he restores it and he makes us new. 
and he meets us in the worst moments of our life, and he does his best work in the fires of those worst moments that are there. Look at how the story ends in verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was there a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. There was no smell of fire on them. Here's the kicker in that. Not only does he take them out of the fire and restore them, he gives them positions of either greater importance in the kingdom. But here's the thing about this story that's, that's always been interesting. Tell me when you see the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego again. You, you don't. I mean, there's references, but you don't see them as integral parts of the story anymore. They literally stop, step off the pages of Scripture after this encounter. And yet I can't help but wonder... As they lived the rest of their life, more than likely in Babylonian captivity, how did they respond on the anniversary of their firewalking experience? I wonder if they thought about that fourth man. I wonder if they thought, man, what was supposed to be the worst experience of our life turned out to be the best. I wonder if they thought what I was supposed to do was to withhold worship from an idol and instead in the midst of the fire, I got to worship like I'd never worshiped ever before. I wonder how their life was marked and how their life was changed by the God who meets you in the fire. <clears throat> See, I don't have to wonder much. I don't have to wonder much because I know what it's like for God to meet you in that fire. I know what it's like for the last 20 years to be able to do ministry, putting faith communities in Texas prisons. We put 20 in. Creating an apartment complex, we bought two that transitioned men and women from prison and drug and alcohol treatment centers back into the community. I don't wonder how good God is. We sang it this morning. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. And with everything that I am able, oh, I will sing the goodness of God. You don't have to wonder about this God and where he meets you and what he does. You don't have to think about it because he's promised he'll meet you in the fire. He's promised he will restore those things the locust has eaten. He's promised all of those things. If you have been in the fire, you'll never be the same. It marks you. It changes you. You carry that moment to the grave because you know what it's like for God to meet you in the middle of the fire. See, I think that maybe the greatest danger for Christ followers in a world that's designed for comfort and ease, our primary goal in life becomes furnace avoidance. We don't want fire. We don't want difficulty. We don't want hardship. We seem to believe that, man, if I follow after this Christ, everything gets better. What did the man himself say in John 16? In this world, you will have what? Trouble, tribulation, difficulty, hardship, moments that are unexplainable. But be of good comfort because I have what? Overcome the world. See, we have a world that wants to avoid the furnace, a world that doesn't want 
to, that, that basically says what Nebuchadnezzar said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Bow your knee. Bow your knee to these idols. Be okay with not being okay. Don't worry about it. Don't let Jesus into this part of your life. Go to the grave. Don't confess this thing. Don't get involved with that. It will be too messy. And you miss the greatest worship moment of your life for a God who meets you in the fire who uses that fire to purify you, to change you, to move you, who uses that moment to never waste a hurt in your life and to help you do the next things. I don't know what the circumstances of your life are or the idols in your heart are, but I do know the golden statue of the king of this world wants us to bend the knee to things like ease and comfort and security and success. Don't confess your struggles. Learn to manage your secrets. Instead of hating your sin, try to manage it. Here is my question. How many of the heroes of the faith do you find in Hebrews chapter 11 that had easy lives where everything just clicked off the way it was supposed to and there were no hardships and there were no troubles and there weren't any things and sin didn't affect their life? Read the list. Samson's in the list. David's in the list. You can't look at King David. I can't read Psalm 51 and not, and not understand that David understands a God that meets him in the fire, creating me a clean heart, oh God, because I know my heart isn't clean. I need you to move. I need you to act. I need you to do what only you can do. I don't need to be made better. I need to be made new. And the only way I get to be made new is by what you do and by what it means that you have taken me. Jesus says, follow me, and you'll always have a big God. You'll have more joy than you can process, and you'll stay in trouble with people of the world all the time. Listen, regen is not going to give you a new life but it points you to the one who does. Regen doesn't have as its end goal sobriety. It has as its end goal full devotion to Christ. And when you find yourself willing to step into the fire because you refuse to bow the knee to those idols anymore, and when you find that one who is faithful to meet you in the fire, you experience that moment where he puts his arm around you, he kisses your cheek, and he says to you, mustn't despair. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this <laughs> incredible story that gives us incredible truth. And thank you for the fact that you have never hesitated to meet us in the fire. You've never hesitated to join us in the midst of our mess and you take our mess and you make it our message. Thank you for this passage of scripture that reminds all of us that you are good and that you never leave us nor abandon us. In Jesus' name. Amen.